There's always an upset or two early in the tournament, and one of them has arrived already courtesy of Saudi Arabia. You know, Spain lost their first match of 2010 as well. So we'll do a deep dive on that match as well as every other match from today. Sounds good? But before that, a quick word from our sponsors for this video, OneFootball, whose app can be your hub for following the World Cup while you're on the go. Not only will OneFootball have match reports for every match at the 2022 World Cup, but they will also have man of the match write up so you can track who's performing the best at the tournament, live tickers during the match with in-depth description of events live, head-to-head -head features for every game, lineups, and more. On top of that, all the features that set it aside as a must-have app for any football fan, video highlights from around the world, behind the scenes content, and so much more. Use the link in the description or scan this QR code because that's what we do in this brave new world and enjoy being in the know. Thanks, OneFootball. Argentina versus Saudi Arabia was just a great big Technology showcase for FIFA in the first half to show just how accurate they can be with offside. Love it or hate it, arguments over whether it helps or hinders the times, I guess the system is at least working properly and accurately. I mean, Argentina had seven offside calls in the first half alone, which was more than the entirety of their 2018 tournament where they had six offside calls. I think most of the calls were just fine. If you guys have been watching me for a while, then you know that I'm more of a fan of drawing the lines where your feet are. For example, this Lotaro offside for one of his two brilliant goals in the first half just leaves a bad taste in the mouth, doesn't it? I get it, offside is offside. You are or you aren't, just like you're pregnant or you're not. But this feels like an anti-football call, no? I know you can technically score with your shoulder, of course, but having his shoulder ahead is the advantage? I mean, how? This is why I like drawing lines on where their feet are instead. But anyway, that was a huge part of the first half, so we had to get that out of the way, but shout out to Saudi Arabia's offside trap as they were moving unified out there with that high line, catching Argentina over and over again. So the goal that did stand for Argentina came from the penalty spot after Paredes had been wrestled to the ground. I understand why this call was seen as a bit soft or what have you, like these things happen all the time from set pieces. So when they finally call it, it's a bit jarring. That's probably the main reason why people question the call is because 95% of the time, referees let that go when it's happening off the ball. And so when it's finally called, even though it's technically the right call, it's a bit confusing, isn't it? There's nothing out of the ordinary with this kind of grappling, but it is out of the ordinary, right or wrong, to call it. Anyway, Saudi Arabia completely changed in the second half after conceding four goals total, only one stood of course. They came out and scored twice against Argentina with both goals coming from the left side of their attack or Argentina's right side of defense. Hmm. Both goals were great finishes, Romero not getting close enough to Salel al Sheri as his strike rolled past Martinez to the corner, and the second, a fantastic strike from Salem al Dasari into the top corner. I really wish I had an Arabic commentator while I was watching, but the one glaring issue that I can see with this Argentina side is a lack of athleticism and pace in some respects. Saudi Arabia was beating them to everything, fighting for everything, way more tenacious on the pitch, and it caused Argentina to look a bit shell-shocked at times. Slower on the ball ball in possession, allowing the Saudi Arabians to surround them. You gotta be a bit faster when playing against a deep block like that. And as time went on, Saudi Arabia had six at the back, so you can imagine what Argentina were up against. No matter the quality of the ball that was being played in, there was a much higher probability that a Saudi Arabian defender would get on the end of it, rather than an Argentinian, and when they didn't, goalkeeper Mohamed al Owais was there to stop it. But one of the great equalizers in a low scoring sport such as this is a great strike of the ball, as Saudi Arabia had for their second. One great strike of the ball can come from anyone, not just the top players in the world, anyone can hit a worldie out of nowhere. You've seen the worst player on your Sunday league side do it, just as you've seen a top, top, top player in world football do it. That's the great equalizer in this sport, that something can come from nothing in a sense. Because yes, it was a great performance defensively from Saudi Arabia, but don't let the result cloud the balance of play. All of the possession for Argentina, every attacking metric, an XG of 2.23 to Saudi Arabia 0.14, the entirety of which came in the second half. I mean, the first eight minutes of the second half is when that XG came. They deserve to win still. That's I'm not saying they didn't. Their high line in the first half and how they completely outworked Argentina, 
But I mean, some people are acting as if they dominated Argentina, which is just a disingenuous take. You don't need to dominate a game to win it in a deserving fashion and end Argentina's 36 match unbeaten run, which stretched to July 2019. So incredible from Saudi Arabia. What could have been if any of Argentina's goals in the first half stood, as that would have really taken the game away from Saudi Arabia. Can Argentina make like Spain in 2010 and win the tournament despite losing their first game? We'll see. Mexico versus Poland, an important match for the two nations that expect to be fighting for a place in the next round, though it seems as though Saudi Arabia is in the mix as well. Everyone is in the mix in this group now. Mexico looked great in the first half of this one, didn't they? Tons of possession and doing well to win their 1v1s in wide areas, with Poland looking to use their young wingbacks in Zalewski from Roma and Matty Cash from Aston Villa. For Mexico, Tata will be disappointed that they didn't capitalize on a few of their opportunities where so often Lozano was the one providing danger down the right flank, just missing the final touch from Vega or Martin, just missing a finisher in the box. And with Lewandowski out there, yes, he struggles in major tournaments, but you know he is capable of turning the game on its head if he's given a little too much time or space. That said, the man had 18 touches in the first half, only four more than Mexican keeper Ochoa, and only three of his nine attempted passes found a teammate. So Mexico were doing a great job in isolating him. He was starving out there. And Lewandowski won a penalty when he was wrestling for the ball with a Mexican defender in the 53rd minute, both players grappling onto each other. And the deciding factor was the leg that was thrown across Lewandowski's path by the Mexican defender, which was the final straw for the referee. Up until that point, it was a 50-50 with each player having a handful of the opponent's shirt. But when Moreno went down, missed the ball and tripped up Lewandowski, penal. But remember what I said about Memo Ochoa in my preview, Mexico's keeper? He emerges from the shadows every four years to become the best keeper in the world? I mean, of course he saved the penalty. Look at this, as the beautiful man got down fast and low to save against Lewandowski, who is still searching for a World Cup goal. Gotta say, not the best struck penalty I've ever seen, but take nothing away from Ochoa there. That's also three consecutive failed penalties for Poland at the World Cup. In the end, Mexico were starving themselves to have someone to finish off their many attacks, while Poland were predictably laborious to watch at times in possession, only showing flashes now and then. Milik coming on in the 85th minute was way too late for me. He's been in great form at Juve, but beyond that, nil-nil the final. So Saudi Arabia top group C so far, Argentina are bottom, Mexico and Poland are mid. Mid at the moment. Tunisia will have seen how Saudi Arabia were rushing Argentina and will have taken some inspiration from that. The energy that they came out with against Denmark was remarkable. I mean, this image says it all, which came after Aisa Laiduni flew into a tackle on Christian Eriksen in the first minute. And that was the theme of the opening exchange. It was rapid stuff out there, no time to catch your breath. And it wasn't until about the 18th minute that Denmark started to come into this game and get up to tempo with the Tunisians, with the delivery of Eriksen proving to be the most reliable source of Denmark's danger. However, it was Tunisia who nearly broke the deadlock first as Denmark's high line was caught out with Jabali getting in behind. He was brilliant, by the way, and rolling it past Schmeichel, clearly offside, but not by much. This was a really open game with each side taking turns running at each other and the atmosphere in the stands, the North African and Middle Eastern teams came with a loud group of supporters behind them, which added so, so much to this World Cup. They needed it, to be honest, as there are plenty of empty seats in the stadium to make up for. The man who provided much of the excitement was Tunisia's Laiduni, who plays for Ferenc Varoshi in Hungary. All action, smooth on the ball, had a close chance as well. He was superb. Jabali, however, forced a great save out of Schmeichel as he tried to dink it over the keeper, but it probably would have been called back for his shoulder being offside. The second half was much, much better from Denmark as they began to really dictate the play and limit the amount of times that Tunisia was able to cut through them. Perhaps Laiduni's chance to run at Schmeichel being their only real spot of danger in the second half, but he opted to cut inside when he had Christensen and Co. beaten already, unfortunately, as he tried to get the pass off. It's like he ran out of steam and belief in himself. Cornelius managed to miss a header from negative yards. <laughs> a tough one as you were diving towards a post, of course, but the optics of that miss. It was Denmark's best chance for sure. Eriksen and Jensen forced some good saves. There was a close penalty call that was ultimately ruled out as the ball hit the Tunisian defender's chest 
and then their hand. So I'm all good with not giving that penalty. And shout out to the ref who went to the monitor and didn't change his mind. Typically when they hit the monitor, they're going to change their mind. It's almost a given that they will, but not here. No, no, the final and a deserved point for each side. Well, it was a fun day, wasn't it? And Australia continued the fun by scoring just nine minutes into their match against defending champions France, who no doubt will have had to fight off some intrusive thoughts surrounding the World Cup champions curse. I mean, we saw what that did to Germany in 2018 out in the group stage. Same deal for Spain, Italy, France in 2002. Brazil dodged it in 2006, but still, Mr. Goodwin getting on the end of a perfect ball in from Matthew Leckie was a nice way to start this one off. France, of course, looked dangerous in the wide areas, thanks to Dembele and Mbappe. Those two were combining well with their teammates, but it was Adrian Rabiot who got the equalizer for France. Rabiot, who has been in a great bit of form for Juve this season, as he nodded it past Ryan, thanks to a stunning ball from Teo Hernandez, who replaced his brother as he came off yet again with an injury. And Rabiot was central to France's second goal as well. A terrible giveaway deep in Australia's half and a quick thinking Mbappe played the ball into Rabiot's path and he cut it back to Olivier Giroud for 2-1. From there, France could have had another. Mbappe with a glaring miss from a great ball in from Griezmann, only for Jackson Irvine of Australia to have a header go off of the post in first half stoppage time. One thing I will say about France's back line is they are not impenetrable. Konate starting in central defense, they will concede opportunities to their opposition, especially without the cover of N'Golo Kante ahead of them as previous French national team center backs have benefit from. After missing a few chances, Mbappe extended the lead over the Australians in the second half. A great header in off the post from Ousmane Dembele, then Kylian Mbappe turned provider as his change of pace was just too much for Australia's defenders. Great ball chipped into the back post for Giroud to head in to take him level with Thierry Henry for the most goals ever for the French national team. He took a beating to get it, but it was worth it, no doubt. France's oldest scorer, the second oldest scorer in the history of the World Cup behind Roger Mila. Good night for Giroud and France. The Aussies score too early, man. Beware of early goals. So, France are sitting pretty at the top, Denmark and Tunisia are mid-table, while Australia sit at the bottom. Tunisia and Australia will play next, while Denmark take on France. Alright guys, that's it for today. I'll have a short out soon to talk about Ronaldo leaving Man United, but other than that, I will see you tomorrow for a watch-along, as we watch Canada take on Belgium. See ya!